You know, it's really important for new teachers to have a mentor at their school, someone they can model themselves after, someone they can look up to and uh, learn demonstrations, lab activities from. No question about it. My mentor at Greenwich High School, when I first started teaching, was Ron Perkins. Wonderful man, a wealth of knowledge, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attribute this uh, demonstration to him because he showed it to me in pretty much the same format. I perhaps elaborate upon a little bit more, and that's what everyone does from their mentor, and that's how we progress as teachers. But Ron Perkins, wonderful man. He did this demonstration, and he did this reading from a fellow named Ira Remsen. Ira Remsen was actually the discoverer, accidentally, of saccharin. Um, he didn't know it, but uh, it was... Uh, some chemicals he was mixing, and he ended up tasting his, licking his fingers and, in the lab, which is not good lab practice, but sweetness he discovered. Uh, you think he made a million dollars? No, his associate did and stole the patent from him, but uh, still, Ira Remsen lives on in my mind. And in his writing, this is a beautiful passage he wrote about his early experience when he was high school age. The students can kind of relate to this. And he talks about doing time in a doctor's office. I can only imagine he was either apprenticing there or hired to wash the, the you know, glassware and the like. But, so there's a reading about that. Here we go. Um, and also, I've, oh, I, I do this ac um, activity um, on the second day. The first day I do a lab, the second day I do this, this demonstration after I've handed out their textbooks, because that's what he's talking about here. While reading a textbook of chemistry, I came upon the statement, nitric acid acts upon copper. Hmm. I was getting tired of reading such absurd stuff, and I was determined to see what that meant. Copper was more or less familiar to me, for copper scents were then in use. I do need to point this out. Copper scents were then in use. Nowadays, pennies are not made of copper. They look like they are, but it's just a copper coating around zinc. It's about 95% zinc. This is a, and they made the change in 1982. It was getting too expensive to make pennies out of pure copper. So they changed it, but a zinc core, and there's a thin coating of copper. Now, again, it's getting too expensive even to make them out of, out of uh, zinc. But um, when it costs more than a penny to make a penny, that just doesn't make sense. No pun intended. Um, this is a 19, no, sorry, 2003. So this is a new penny, and an older one here from 1977, okay? You can, Feel the difference. The, the old penny weighs a bit more. Copper's denser than zinc, and it's about 3.1 grams versus only 2.5 grams. But it's, that's kind of hard to do, but it's easier to hear the difference. So listen carefully. I'm going to drop the old penny first. Listen to it. Again. It's got a ring quality to it because it's pure copper. Resonates. The newer penny, you don't hear any of that ringing sound, that high-pitched ring. So old one, got a ring to it. The new one, not. And sometimes when I get pennies from the bank, I get a pile of them, and I need to sort them for this demonstration and for other purposes. Rather than try to read the dates, or even half them, I drop them, and I just sort them that way. Drop them, move them. One. So quick way of sorting pennies is even with your eyes closed. Huh, think about that. So I don't want the new penny for this. I want the old one, the kind they had back in Ira Remsen's day. So copper acts upon, I'm sorry, nitric acid acts upon copper. I had seen a bottle marked nitric acid on a table in the doctor's office where I was then, quote unquote, doing time. I did not know its peculiarities, but the spirit of adventure was upon me. Ooh. Well, you know what? Probably the bottle he picked up in the doctor's office just said nitric acid, probably a glass bottle with raised glass letters, you know, old fashioned. But um, today we have more labeling than that, thankfully. Uh, so here are some of its peculiarities. Danger, ext extremely corrosive to all body tissues. Causes severe and immediate damage to body tissues. Strong oxidizer. Nitric acid will react violently with many substances. Avoid all body contact. Use in a hood if possible. We've got a vent right here over this demonstration. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is one of the more dangerous compounds that we use in the chemistry lab. Um, I'm actually going to put on a couple of gloves before I open the bottle. Um, let me get them on now, as a matter of fact. Having nitric acid and copper, I had only to learn what the words act upon meant. The statement, nitric acid acts upon copper, would then be something more than mere words. I was even willing to sacrifice one of the few copper scents then in my possession. He wasn't a very wealthy little kid. Um, I put one of them on the table, 
open the bottle marked nitric acid, poured some of the liquid on the copper, and prepared to make an observation. <laughs> well, we're not going to do it quite that way. We've got a setup here that's a little bit more uh, safe and user friendly than that. Um, let me explain what I've got. I've got a, a Florence flask here, a one hole stopper, some tubing, another little piece of connecting tubing, and then a glass tube that goes down into this graduate. This graduate contains just some water with a little bit of phenolphthalein and just a tiny bit of sodium hydroxide to give it that pink blue, uh, pink, that pink uh, base color, okay? So, um, and here's a little kind of nice little tip. If these connections here are too loose, if this isn't a nice connection, electrician's tape, great stuff. A wrap or two of that, as much as it takes, makes for a nice fitting here and here because these should be pretty airtight. Okay, another nice little trick of the trade here. I'm going to put the penny in there, but if I just drop in there, I run the risk. It's slight, but maybe one time in ten I might crack the, the flask. But just turning this on its side like that and then sliding the penny on that makes it much less likely to crack the flask. Okay, so we've got that. And I'm going to need um, about 20 milliliters of my nitrate. You can see some fumes coming off the top here. Um, just about 20 mils. I'm going to approximate that. It's not terribly important the exact amount you use, just as long as you don't use too little. Okay? Put the top on that. And to really cut down on the fumes, I'm going to stop for this right here. Okay? So let's get a look at this because we've got lots of things we can see here. Right away, we got bubbling here. And check this out bubbling going on here. That kind of makes sense. If this is producing a gas, it's going to be pushing that over into here, bubbling away, bubbling away. Huh. So I let the students observe this. They're taking notes. I have special lab, uh, sorry, demonstration note sheets that they take this on. And there's observations, explanations. This is the second day, member of school, so this is the first demonstration they've actually seen. And they're enthralled. They've got lots of colors. I don't know if you can see this dark greenish blue liquid that's here. You can certainly see the reddish brown gas. It appears to be a pretty dense gas because it's formed from the bottom up. You don't see it so much here. And then apparently it disappears because I see no red brown gas coming out the top here. So something's going on between there and there. I do see a little bit of red brown in this tube here, but once it gets into the flask, we don't see much of that at all. So we'll keep an eye on this. I, I think I see the color getting a little bit lighter here too, but that might just be my expectation of it there from having done this so many times before. Okay, so I'll go back to this now. He says, um, and prepared to make an observation. But what was this wonderful thing which I beheld? The scent was already changed. And it was no small change either. I don't know if that was an intentional pun there, small change, the scent, I don't know. A green-blue liquid fumed and foamed over the, over the scent and over the table. The air in the neighborhood of the performance became colored dark red. They said in the neighborhood. I love that. A great colored cloud arose. <coughs> this was disagreeable <coughs> and suffocating. I'm actually adding the little coughing there. Okay. I'll tell you why that was disagreeable and suffocating. Here's a nice little lesson. Oh, look what happened here. Did we capture that? While I was talking, this did go colorless. So apparently this gas is doing something in terms of dissolving in here. In fact, it's kind of neat. You can see the brown tube going down in, but then it's no brown gas coming out. About the brown gas, why was it disagreeable and suffocating? Because it's poisonous. In fact, here's a statement you can take to the bank. All colored gases are poisonous. Okay? That gas is poisonous. Why am I not dying here? Because I'm not being exposed to any of that. Okay? Now, a little slight whiff of it, not a big deal. You, know, well, you want to avoid that, but he was <coughs> suffocating in the doctor's office. Um, all color gases are poisonous. Now, don't make the connection think if it's colorless gas, it's necessarily non-poisonous because the most, most cases of gas poisoning come from carbon monoxide, which is colorless. But if it's colored, it certainly is poisonous. I point out to my students that that might save their life someday, maybe 10 years down the road, one of my students and a friend are, you know, walking through the mall or something like that, and they look up and they see this pipe and this, I don't know, purple gas leaking out, and the friend of the student says, hey, dude, look at that. Let's go check it out. And my student, this is, again, 10 years after taking my course, says, ah, wait, I seem to recall my high school chemistry teacher warning us that all color gases are poisonous. Let's go alert the authorities instead. Yeah. 
So I can only dream, but maybe someday that'll save their life. The fact that they know that all colored gases are poisonous. So back to the story. He was <laughs> disagreeable and suffocating. He says, um, how should I stop this? Remember, he was doing out here in the open. I tried to get rid of the objectionable mess by picking it up and throwing out the window. Wouldn't that be the greatest way of getting rid of all of our problems? Yeah, pick it up and throw out the window. Um, wait a second, I lost my place here. Um, I tried to get rid of the objectionable mess by picking it up and throwing it out the window. I learned another fact. Nitric acid not only acts upon copper, it acts upon fingers. Remember all the, the things I read about the corrosiveness of it? Yeah, you'd feel it pretty quickly. <laughs> what would happen now? You've just picked up something, some liquid. It's, your fingers are hurting. What would you instinctively do? Now, when I ask my students that, they say, oh, put it in your mouth. I don't think so. What, I would, I'd go like this, right? You want to get off your, off your fingers. So here's what he says. Um, the pain led to another unpremeditated experiment. I love it, unpremeditated experiment. I drew my fingers across my trousers. Another fact was discovered. Nitric acid acts upon trousers. <laughs> it does, too. <laughs> Taking everything into consideration, that was the most impressive experiment and relatively probably the most costly experiment. Not just the penny and his sore fingers, but he's got a hole in his trousers now, too. The most costly experiment I've ever performed. It was a revelation to me. It resulted in a desire on my part to want to learn more about that remarkable kind of action. Isn't that chemistry in a nutshell right there? That remarkable kind of action? What you just saw taking place in this flask? That remarkable kind of action. What a great statement that is. I almost want to take chemistry out of our course selection book and just that remarkable kind of action. Get a lot more students signed up for it and they come all excited like, ooh. Plainly, the only way to learn about it was to see its results, to experiment, to work in a laboratory. Now, you think this is done, don't you? But it's not. The best is yet to come. And uh, while I've been talking, you did see that the penny is pretty much done reacting. I see a little bit left of it in there. That's why it's slowing down a bit. Um, but look what happened. The bubbling stopped. And if you look carefully, you probably can notice that the, the, that brown gas was all the way at the bottom of the tube is not only at the bottom. In fact, there's water up to there, and the water's gradually climbing. So we're going to let this uh, go here a bit. It's always hard to time it just right with my class. I sometimes have to stall. Um, but uh, this is coming out just about right, time-wise. Now we've got something interesting here. It didn't just stop there, but it's actually, apparently we have negative pressure, or less pressure here than outside. First instinct, oh, this is pulling the water up into it, like as though it's become thirsty, it's drinking through the straw. But uh, we later on, remember this is only the second day, but we later on learn that no, there's no such thing as a pulling force because of a, of a vacuum or a partial vacuum. Rather, atmospheric pressure is now pushing that liquid up the straw. All we can say is that there's less pressure in here than outside. There's no pulling force associated with pressure, though. Wow, we're almost all the way up to here. You've got to wonder what it is. Well, this brown gas is actually NO2. I don't get into all this that first day. Nitrogen dioxide gas, it is poisonous. If you do um, the electron dot structure for it, you see that it's got an odd number of electrons. And it actually is that unpaired electron that accounts for not only its color, but its extreme reactivity and poisonous nature. So, um, and also, it's a bent molecule, rather polar and very, very water-soluble, which is why we didn't see it come out here. We didn't see any brown gas come out here. It's all dissolved in here. Non-metal oxides, nitrogen oxide, dissolve in water to make an acid. There's so much chemistry in this, and you can revisit the same demonstration over and over. And now I don't want to miss this part. Oh, right here, the water coming over. And now that the water, <laughs> fresh water in this flask of NO2, which I just told you is very water soluble, look what happens here. And talk about beautiful colors. They saw maybe a dark green liquid down there now. Of course, we know that that's a copper solution. One more effect. Listen carefully. 
<laughs> they can all relate to that. They got to the bottom of their soda, whatever, and the straw just draws up air. And look at this, the brown gas almost gone, and if I actually just give this a little shake, the brown gas is almost completely gone. Now, I invite a student to come up and say, to describe to everyone the penny now, what it looks like. And they come up fully expecting to see that penny still in there, okay? But of course, they come up and it's like, it's not there. I said, what do you mean it's not there? You saw me put it in there. It's gone. Where is it? Here's a very logical connection. It was a brown, a reddish brown coin, and they saw a reddish brown gas come across. They figured that was the penny. I mean, it makes sense, color for color, but of course, there's the copper. It's in solution. Now, I did this demonstration once and had uh, um, a student say, I love this. I, I, Oh, can you get the penny back? What a great question. And of course you can. I usually do this in a little beaker, but I'm gonna just pour out a little bit of this solution into this tray here. Okay, that's not much. That's maybe just the top of Lincoln's head from the penny. <laughs> as long as I can offer that solution, a metal that's more reactive than copper, and by the way, almost every metal is, uh, I can maybe have an exchange, a little ion exchange program going here. So I've got, iron's a good one, and I'm not sure, sometimes iron scissors, those little real cheapo scissors work. I'm buffing it up with a little bit of steel wool, and I'm just gonna see if I can dip this in there and get a quick copper coating on there. I think this is too much, uh, this might be plated. I'm gonna go with just a piece of iron wire. It's not quite as big but it'll do the trick. Actually, I'll do it on this end. When I do this with my students, I have a camera on it, and that's really convenient. They can see it almost right away. It turns dark. That doesn't look so copper-colored, but that is, a copper co that is a copper coating that forms on there right away. And I could scrape that off, do it again. It would take me a while, but I could essentially recover all those copper atoms. I guess I have to melt them down what year was it, a 1974, whatever? I'd find a 1974 mold, whatever, and I could essentially reclaim that same copper penny if I wanted to. Um, it'd be a lot of work, but it's all still there. That is rather amazing. Where were those copper atoms just uh, 15 minutes ago? They were locked inside a penny, and now here they are coating that uh, piece of wire. <sighs> what do I do with this now? That's an important question. I mean, you got the solution, just dump it down the sink? I don't think so. Uh, copper is also poisonous in solution like that. And I'll grant it, one little penny's worth of copper, a few grams of copper, probably wouldn't amount to a whole lot dumping that down the sink. But if everyone did that, so it's not good practice. Um, a quick word on that, by the way. Uh, do you guys like pickles? Yeah? Guess what? Pickles are cucumbers, right? Soaked in vinegar. But if you just take a little cucumber, soak it in vinegar, it turns more yellow than, uh, than just this beautiful green like the cucumber was originally the, um, before you put it in there. So how do you get the green color back again? Let's see, yellow plus what would make green? Well, blue. 100 years ago, pickle manufacturers, pickle bottlers, whatever, would add copper ions to the pickles to get that nice dark green color. I don't think it did anything for the flavor. It did do something for the toxicity of those pickles. And for years, people who ate lots of pickles were having problems, liver cancer and the like, and many people dying from really an unnecessary poison. Now, they don't use copper in pickles anymore, don't worry. They use some blue food color, I'm sure. But it's an interesting little anecdote there about it. If you do a little Google search on uh, pickles and old recipes, you'll see adding copper salts, like copper sulfate, to the vinegar to give it the green color. So what do I do with it? In my classroom, I have a separate container labeled copper waste, and I take all the leftover solution, and if I do this demonstration, second day for each of my classes, that's about five, that's about half a liter, so two and a half liters. This bucket 
gets filled. And what do we do then after the students are all gone? Then I dump it down the sink. No, of course not. That <laughs> no, I don't do anything with it. I just leave it there in the fume hood. And gradually the water, and that's 99.9% .9 water, evaporates off. When I grab the bucket, literally the next year, the, water, the liquid level from here is down to there. And I have beautiful copper nitrate crystals on the bottom, but I don't need them for anything. Do the demonstration again, goes up to there, next year it's back down. I'll grant it, maybe 30 years down the road, I will have to pay to have this taken off my hands as toxic waste. But I'm certainly not going to pay to have 99.9% .9 water taken there. So a nice little disposal technique that makes sense. And, and any time I have copper waste remaining in the labs I do, it goes in there too. But I keep that separate from the other heavy metal waste. So there it is, that remarkable kind of action, the Ira Remsen demonstration, and Ron Perkins, thank you. <laughs>